uh, when Jesus came, he did not come to start a religion. Yeah. You know, he came to introduce God to us and to create the relationship with God that, you know, for man, the way he had it with his heavenly father. And if you go back and look at even the Garden of Eden, there, it wasn't, there was no religious aspect to it. It was just man walking with God. And so really religion didn't come in until later on. And, and the funny thing is, even then it wasn't religion. It was simply because man messed up, there were certain things that had to be done because of the mess up. And, it's, and we, we took those rituals and turned them into a religion and think that doing those rituals makes us right with God. And it doesn't. If it had, Jesus wouldn't have had to come because we had all that. And so, um, you know, looking at what Jesus preached and what he talked about, um, some of the things that we're going to talk about today has been, or I've already mentioned before, but I really want to be able to bring it to you today in a way of slightly different than we've done before. And so um, before we actually get into this, we're going to go ahead and take up the offering, I guess, receive the offering, however you want to say it, All right? Y'all ready? Oh, y'all are ready. Good deal. All right, we'll go ahead and pass this. Father, we thank you for the finances that you bring into the kingdom. Father, we thank you that we are blessed to be able to share in this offering, that we are, are able to take these finances and expand your kingdom with it, to be able to bless and to help. And Father, we thank you that we are establishing your covenant on this earth. Father, you said that it is, it is you who give us the ability to create wealth so that we can establish the covenant upon this earth. We thank you for that, Father. So in Jesus' name, right now, we bless those that can give, and we bless those that would desire to give but can't. And we say right now, let your blessings flow through their lives, that we can be a light unto the people of this world and touch the people in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> we, uh, last week, we were talking about understanding the kingdoms. And we're talking about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And there's overlaps there, so you really have to kind of look at all of it together to really see the whole picture. Uh, we did in, in one session. Obviously, you can, you can very seldom do justice to any biblical truth in one session. But we you kind of took the best shot at it that we could. And we're going to be talking about this off and on uh, as the Lord directs. And so today... We're going to be looking at an aspect of the kingdom, but I'm trying to tie two things together, and I really feel this is the Spirit of God. So just remember, sometimes um, <clears throat> true ministry doesn't always look polished, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't always just everything fit together just like you want, uh, but we're going to look at a couple of things. So first off, uh, for years, and many people may or may not know this, for years I was right on the verge of, <clears throat> how can I say this, of actually doing something the Bible says not to do uh, in this particular area. And it was, it was specifically, the scripture says, to despise, not prophesy. And I was right at that verge because I'd seen so much of the flake, uh, the, well, the flake and the fake, uh, just, <laughs> you know, just so much of it that I just got to a point where I'm, I'm like, I don't care. Just, I, you know, just avoid it altogether. And like I said, I was right on that verge of actually doing what the Bible says not to, and I was at the point where I was ready to start despising prophesying because of the way I saw it. But then I was blessed because I was actually called to minister out in Santa Maria, California, with a man there that was truly operates as a prophet. And because of that, and while we were even there, uh, I think my daughter was with me. We were on the, one of the front rows there. He had never met me. I'd never met him before. I uh, didn't know any details uh, I'm sure there's some things he could have found out by reading the internet, reading our web page, but there's a lot that he spoke to us. He actually called me and my daughter out, and they had a group there, kind of a presbytery, and began speaking into our lives. And they gave my daughter a specific word, and actually several of the different people there operated prophetically there. And actually at that time, my son and my daughter-in-law were about to have their first child uh, named Josiah. And in the process of them, of this prophet giving me a word, which I didn't ask for, and I've never pursued or, you know, went to somebody and said, do you have a word for me? Never done that. Um, <clears throat> kind of like Dr. Summerall, always figured if, 
uh, people would always come to him and say, I have a word for you from the Lord. And he said, well, if you know him so well, you go do the word. And he said, God knows where I live. He can talk to me if he wants to, but he didn't just let anybody walk up and just start saying stuff to him. And so whenever we were there, they began speaking to our life. And one of the things that this prophet spoke to me, and he said, uh, I'm bringing you a Josiah generation. And didn't, as I said, my, uh, my son and, and his wife had just uh, told us that the name of this, of their, they just found out the, that their child was going to be a boy. And they said, if, if it's a boy, then they're going to name him Josiah. And so now this prophet had no way of knowing this or anything else because I had just heard that myself. And so he spoke that. When he spoke that, I kind of perked up. I thought, okay, you know, he's, he's hitting pretty close here. And so then he began to proceed and actually spoke for some time. And one good thing about that particular group is if they're always ready with a tape recorder or some type of recorder, and they record, and they, they're very adamant about recording prophetic words because they don't believe in just people just saying things. They believe you ought to be able to go back and check them and, and see if when they come to pass, you ought to be able to, to listen to them. And matter of fact, you know, one of the things that uh, Paul told Timothy was that to basically pay attention to the prophecies that had been put out upon him and, and he was told to war a good warfare with the prophecies that had been given. And that's one aspect that, honestly, I, I've been around a lot of Christians, and most Christians don't know how to war a good warfare with prophecies. And so I had to study that out and then started doing some research and, 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 he, and just asking God, basically. And he said, well, this is what I meant. And so basically with a prophecy, some prophecies are just going to come to pass. Some of them are conditional, and some of them, you have an aspect. You do this, and then God does that. And until you do that, God doesn't do that. So there are aspects of prophecy that you have to judge, and the Bible says in the New Testament, we are to judge prophets, the, the words of a prophet or, or prophecies that come forward. And so we're not just supposed to take them you know, just as they are. We have to judge them, and I wouldn't say analyze them, but check them out. Make sure they line up with Scripture. And so we started doing that, and... and you know, it's funny because even the ministry itself over the years uh, was predominantly, in many ways, it was the foundation of this ministry. I mean, even back in 1934, uh, Dr. Lake gave a prophecy, which is the reason I am in the position I am today, uh, because the family heard the prophecy, and we had made contact, and eventually they decided that uh, I was the person that this prophecy was talking about. And so it's funny because the very reason I'm in this ministry is because of a prophetic word, and yet for years, like I said, I was on the verge of despising prophesying. And so, which you can kind of see the work of the enemy there, trying to take us away. Well, and, and we've always been sticklers for the word and making sure that what we say lines up with Scripture and keeping it on Scripture. And, and you can kind of fall into a ditch on either side. You can either become so, quote, unquote, I would even say pseudo-prophetic, that you get weird. You know, and, and you just say anything, and every week, you know, next week's going to be a bigger prophecy than last week. And then you got a stack of prophecies that never come to pass, and nobody judges them, and you can say whatever you want to say pretty much in the church today, and nobody will check you on it, or call you on it, I should say. Uh, or you can go the other side and just get so legalistic and dead that the Spirit of God can't hardly even move in your midst. And so we don't want to be in either ditch. We want to make sure that we are in the middle. We want to be right where God wants us. And so in that... I want to show you a couple of things here, and we're going to still be talking about the kingdom, but I want to show you, you know, if you consider yourself, let me just say, how many of you here right now, you consider yourself a part of this fellowship, part of J.G. Lim, part of this fellowship? All right, well, God bless you. All right. The, the reason I'm saying that is because, very honestly, I take that, like I said earlier, it's a high privilege uh, to pastor this fellowship and to, we pastor people around the world now, but in the middle of it, it's a high privilege, but it's also a great responsibility. Because I know that many people, and I, I hear from people all the time that say, you know, your teaching on this has changed my life. And, and I hear people say, we've taken this teaching and we're doing this. So I recognize that the words that come out of my mouth alter people's destinies. And so I'm very cognizant of what I say. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, aware, and I always want to make sure that I'm right. I want to make sure, not for the sake of being right, but I just don't want to lead anybody off in a direction that, you know, is not right. And so I'm very careful about things. Now... In saying that, if you're, you know, as we'd say, if you're hitched to this wagon, then where I go, you go. 
And so that's another reason why I'm so careful about where I go, because I want to make sure I don't take you somewhere you don't need to go. And so in these prophetic words, if they were spoken to me and, and they're accurate from God by the Spirit of God, then because of that and because of where I'm going, as I said, you will go too. So I think it's only right that you should know some of the things that have been said and put forth. So I'm going to bring some of those things out and they directly tie in with what we're, what we're talking about right now in the last couple of weeks. So if you want to first, you can go to Matthew chapter 13. This week, we are talking about the keys of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom. And so we're obviously going to go to Matthew 13, then we're going to go to Matthew 16. So you can go to both of those. Matthew 13, we'll go to first in verse 10. And if you remember this, this was out of last week. We mentioned this last week in the service. Verse 10 says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now notice, he was speaking to them, but he was speaking in parables, and he even said after that to him that has ears to hear, and he said, you know, that, that in hearing they wouldn't hear, but in, in seeing they wouldn't see, or they would perceive not. So he said, I'm putting it out there, but they're not getting it. And then the disciples came to him and said, why are you talking in parables? He said, because it's not given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to you it is. You are to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And the word mystery there is, is the word mysterion, and it means literally something hidden, and it means as in, in terms of a secret, and it even talks about being initiated into something that is a secret. So that's just different ideas of the mystery. Now, if you'll also notice, uh, about a week ago, week ago Wednesday, we ministered on Paul's revelation which was the mystery of the ages. Now, I want to be very distinct here. Um, here, Jesus is telling, well, Peter and the, and the disciples, that there are mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of heaven that they should know. And then the amazing thing is, he talked about all these mysteries right in the next few passages where he talked about the, what we call the kingdom of heaven uh, parables. So he gave all these mysteries and laid them out. So that's not the mystery that Paul said had been hidden from the beginning of, of the age, right? So remember, that's two separate things. One is the mystery, which without that mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, there is no church. But now we also look at these mysteries of the kingdom, and we know that when, if you're in the church, you're in the kingdom, okay? Now, that kingdom is also within you. Now, the kingdom of God is said to be within you, and... The kingdom of heaven is, is generally more a, uh, something that you can see, but yet the kingdom of God is something you can't generally see, but you see the results of it. I would almost say that the kingdom of God is in you, and the kingdom of heaven is the physical representation of the kingdom of God that's in you, right? So I, I wouldn't want to make that a doctrine, but it's pretty, pretty close to uh, being a, an accurate way of saying it. Now, he talked about these mysteries of the kingdom. And in a few minutes, I'm going to read to you some things about mysteries. And I started looking at this. And last night, as a matter of fact, last night, over the last couple of weeks, but especially last night, it all kind of came together. And I just, <laughs> my wife didn't look at me several times ago. Okay, what's going on? I'm like, this, I'm, I'm getting this, I'm seeing this, I'm going back and looking at this. And she started trying to talk to me. And I'm like, hey, hang on. And she goes, yeah. she goes, hello, you're not even here, are you? You're not even here. You know, it's just, <laughs> so, because I was, you know, as we'd say, we get, I was getting a download. You know what I'm it was just coming, and as it came, I'm just thinking, okay, that, that fits with that, and that goes there, and there. so all of a sudden, it's like, okay, where, I need to get a Bible, so I started going through this, and grabbed my iPad, and started looking up scriptures, and, you know, then grabbed my, my physical Bible, and started going through different scriptures, and I started seeing this, these prophecies that had been given as far back as, well, some of them go way back, but um, the ones that I'm specifically referring to right now go back to about 03, I guess, 2003. And it's funny because you can see how some are coming to pass right now. Some have come to pass, and then there's some that are coming to pass, but yet there's parts of it that is still for the future. And you can tell it's for the future, but it's all happening, right? And that's why I want you to know what's going on, because this will help you know where we're going, 
right? So, you know, one thing I hate, I hate to get in a car and we're going somewhere and I say, where are we going? And they say, oh, we're just, we're just going somewhere. You, you know, we'll, you know, well, how long is it going to take us? Well, you know, it won't take too long, right? That tells me absolutely nothing, right? And I hate sitting in the back of a car or in the passenger seat and wondering where we're going. You know, tell me where we're going. I don't even care if I know where it's at. Just tell me where we're going, right? I want to know my destination. I want to know where I'm headed. And <clears throat> that, that's just my personality. And so I'm trying to tell you ahead of time kind of where we're headed so you can get an idea. If you know where you are and you know where you're going, you have a pretty good idea of how to get there. Usually you can figure it out. So that's what we're going to do today. Now, Matthew 13, verse 10 and 11, he just told them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. Okay, now go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, verse 13, it starts with Jesus, and he says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now, that would have been a real trick, because they were both in the same place at the River Jordan. So, some Elias and others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Who do you say I am, right? I hear, I hear you saying what they say, but who do you say I am? In verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now notice first off, Simon Simon Peter, he's always the first one to shoot his mouth off, right? And first thing he says, Lord, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looks at him and says, Blessed art thou. In other words, the word blessed, as I said last week, means spiritually prosperous. Spiritually prosperous. He said, Simon Barjona, and the word Barjona means son of Jonas, or his father's name was Jonah, right? So he said, Simon, Simon Barjona, you are blessed. You are spiritually prosperous prosperous because now notice flesh and blood has not revealed this to you in other words you didn't figure this out he says but my father which is in heaven so here this is the first revelation so to speak that we see reference to of somebody other than Jesus and then in verse 18 and I say also unto thee so now notice he's talking to Peter here that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the word Peter there in the Greek is the word Petros, and it means a piece of a larger rock. A piece of a large rock. We could say one, one translation even says a pebble, but another one says a stone, even a stone. But now notice here, he says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, you're a piece of a larger rock, and he says, and upon this rock, now that word rock there is the word Petra, and it means the larger mass of rock, right? So now you, what he's saying is, listen, this, upon this rock, you're, you're a piece of this rock, but upon this rock, now notice, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that, now, you have to realize what he's talking about here is he's talking about this revelation of Jesus being the Son of the living God, that He is the Christ. He said, that's the revelation. Now, He was not building, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. Right? That's not what He was talking about. He said, what I'm going to build my church on is the fact that, that my Father reveals to people who I am and the revelation that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? That is the basis of the church. Now, I know that's not revelation to you. It was at one time, but it's not now, okay? Now, and in verse 19, he says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom, right? Of what kingdom? The kingdom of heaven, right? So it has a lot to do with the visible kingdom on this earth. He said, I'm going to give you some keys that's going to cause things to 
It's going to open up certain things. It's going to allow things to be seen here and physically. Because remember, he said, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, go and preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And when you go and preach, you say, the kingdom is at hand and heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. So here he said, I'm giving you keys that will allow these manifestations. But now notice the first key here, if you want to call it a key, is the revelation that Jesus is the son of the living God. That's the first one, right? Now, but now after that, he says, because of that revelation, I'm going to give unto you the keys, plural, of the kingdom of heaven. Now watch what these keys are going to do. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So these keys have to do with binding things on earth. Now, one translation even says, going back to the original Greek, says that you will bind, and anything you bind will have already been bound in heaven. Now, I've heard that preached a bunch of different ways, but you have to realize your Heavenly Father has, He knows what you have need of before you ask. So whenever you bind something, and it says it's already bound, it doesn't mean that you're finding what is bound. That, I mean, there would be a truth to that. But he's saying by the time you ask, it's already done because your Heavenly Father already knows what you need. Right? So now you're just, allow, you're, you're just making the requisition and heaven has already granted it. This is where I actually got the idea whenever I tell people when a child of God or a son of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees and hell hears and obeys. Right? This is that verse. This is where I got that from, right? Now, notice it says, And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, you'll notice this is in the exact same scripture where it talks about these keys. So the keys of the kingdom of heaven have to do with binding and loosing and has to do with you being in contact with heaven and, uh, and allowing, or I should say, heaven backing you up so that, that what is seen on the earth is representative of heaven. Okay, you got that? So the keys of the kingdom of heaven have to do with binding and loosing. But now notice, that means allowing and forbidding things to happen. Now notice, then he says, and we're going to come back to that in just a minute, remember those terms. Remember the term mysteries. Remember the term keys. Because think of this, a key is something that opens something. Right? Now, we know that keys throughout history represents generally one main thing, but it usually it represents some form of authority. If you, have, if you have keys, they give you the key to the city. There's some uh, privileges, benefits, something, and it, it, has some, it, it uh, represents some form of, of authority. So if you have the keys of the kingdom of heaven, then you have some type of authority in the kingdom of heaven, and that means that you can open things that are locked. Now, Things that are locked, and this goes right back to what we talked about last week, things that are locked tend to be mysteries to us. And that's exactly what it goes back to when it talks about mysteries. It's saying these things are hidden, they're secret, they are hidden back. And we see that exactly in Matthew 13 when he talks about the parables. He said, the reason I speak in parables is because these things are hidden. They're locked away from these people, but they are given to you that you might understand these mysteries, these things that are locked. And he said, and because you understand who I am, he said, these people don't know who I am. To these people, okay, let's go back here just a second. Remember what he said at the beginning. Who do you say that I am? Well, before that, he said, who do they say? And they said, oh, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Who is he? A prophet, right? And some say Elias and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. So what did the people think? They weren't coming to him to be healed because he was the Christ, they were coming to him to be healed because they saw that a great prophet had arisen in Israel, which is exactly what it says about him at one place. So they have this idea. They did not have an understanding of who he was. His disciples did. They started seeing, no, you're somebody different. You are the Messiah. We believe that. We're, we're staking everything on you, right? We've already been run out of the temple. You know, we can't go in there and worship anymore because they, you know, they know that we follow you. And every time we go in there, they end up, you know, you heal somebody and then they run us out. And so this idea that they had this knowledge of the, this mystery, this is one of the mysteries. And because of that, they were open and they could understand the other mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So these keys open things. Now, let's go on. I'm going to read and I'm going to come back to these keys. So the keys, remember the keys of the kingdom, or remember the keys and mysteries. Remember those two words. 
Then in verse 20, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now see, that right there proves that Jesus didn't go around healing to prove he was the Christ because he just here said, don't go tell anybody I'm the Christ, right? And when, even when demons said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. I mean, you realize demons knew that before some of these disciples did? And he told them, hold your peace. Why? Because he didn't want them to tell who he was. So he was not healing to prove who he was. He was healing because of compassion. He was healing because of who he was, but not to prove who he was. Right? You get that? Now remember that. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now you realize he said from that time on. So from Matthew 16. Now, how many chapters does Matthew have? 28, right? So almost in the middle, right? So halfway through, they find out who he is, and he, from that point, he starts saying, listen, here's the plan. I've got to go. I've got to suffer. I've got to die. I've got to be ready. He told them that. They, he, he point blank told them. And then even after he died and was resurrected, many of them didn't even believe he was raised from the dead, Amen. right? So if his ministry lasted from roughly three to four years, based on the chronology of it, then somewhere around a year and a half to two years is when he probably told them this. So for a year and a half, they had all this time to think about it, hear about it, ask questions about it. And yet even after it happens, then they're all hiding, thinking, what are we going to do now? Our, our rabbi, our master is gone. And, he, and then he shows up and says, why do you doubt? Now think about that. So see, you're, you're, not, as, <laughs> you're not as bad off as you thought. Right? They were with him and they had those kind of thoughts. So imagine whenever you think, well, why does God allow this? And why does that happen? And why is it? See, they, you're not that much different than them. Amen? And they had a whole lot more personal contact with Jesus physically in their, in, in their presence. Right? So don't be too hard on yourself whenever you ask questions like that. Next, he says, <clears throat> and this is, um, well, I, yeah, I just had to bring this out to you. For, he, he showed that he must be killed and raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him. Now notice, as soon as he starts talking about being killed and raised and all this, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Imagine rebuking Jesus. Right? Saying, be it far from thee. Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Now that's strong language. I mean, he just turns around and says, get behind me, Satan, which means adversary, basically. But he says, get behind me. You're an offense to me. Why? Because he's trying to convince him you don't have to go die. See? When you know your purpose, anybody that tries to tell you that's not your purpose, they're an offense to you. That's why we can't, we have to make sure we're not an offense to somebody by telling them, you'll never amount to anything. There's no hope for you. Right? Believe me, if there's breath, there's hope. Amen? Amen? He says, Thou art an offense to me, because you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. Now, he had just said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Revelation from God. A revelation that nobody else had at that time, basically, other than, you know, demons that knew it. But imagine here. He just gives this great revelation, this great statement. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my, my church on this revelation of who I am. And then he turns around and says, no, it's not going to happen that way, Lord. We're not going to let you die. And Jesus says, listen, get, get behind me, Satan, because he said, you, because you don't think, you're not thinking like God. He said, you're, you're, you're thinking like man. You get that? So here's this man that can receive great revelation one minute and the next minute be operating totally carnal, totally after the things of the flesh, so I'm just trying to show you here, and, just this, and this is not the main point I'm getting to, but I'm just trying to show you, you can have great revelation, you can have great victories, you can have great faith for things, and yet in a moment, in a, in a second of time, switch and be thinking carnal. Amen. Right? So every word that comes out of somebody's mouth, you, don't, you shouldn't always take as, as gospel. Because one minute they can be talking about revelation, the next minute they can be trying to figure out that revelation from a carnal mindset and give you a total wrong conclusion. I've read books where the people laying down their argument, it's so right on, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is good, this is good. And then they lay all the pieces out, 
And then when they put the puzzle together, they come to a conclusion that is so far off that I'm thinking, how did they get that? You know, how did one plus one plus one equal 16? How did that do that? Because they're just that far off. But it, says, it shows you can get revelation in truth of the Word of God, and yet in a split second because of previous teaching or anything else, you can think wrong and put a wrong connotation to it or a wrong conclusion. I mean, so just because you've got revelation on something, it, that does not mean that the way you think about everything is right. You can still think carnal, right? That's why our minds have to be renewed in every area, and they have to all work together. That's one of the main things. Everything we say, you ought to be able to take apart and put together with anything else we say in order to line up and not violate any principles, right? Because that's the Word of God. The Word of God fits together seamlessly regardless of what topic you're talking about. So if you have a, if you have a topic of healing, and you're talking about healing in the atonement, and then you talk about God not healing a person because of this thing in their life, those two cannot sit together. You are violating the very basic principle of the Word of God having to work together. Right? So, just something to think about. Now, then he said, in verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For a hoot, now you realize taking up your cross meant you knew that the end of that was going to be death. <clears throat> I love what Leonard Ravenhill used to say. He said, one thing for sure, when you saw a man carrying a cross out of Jerusalem, you knew one thing, he wasn't coming back. And think about that. That's how strong, when Jesus talked about this cross, that's what they knew. He said, you're taking up my path, and it leads to one place, death to yourself. He said, you will not come back this way. Again, you understand that? He says, And whosoever shall save his life <clears throat> shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now that's what Jesus said, right? So now notice, when Jesus returns, that's when he's bringing his rewards, right? Healing isn't a reward. You get that? Healing, Jesus is going to heal. He's going to bring his reward with him to give to every man according to his works when he returns. What's going on right now, anything you see in life is not rewards. You understand that? Now, I, I mean, I understand there's an aspect where in sowing and reaping, if you want to call it, but let's get specific. Anybody can sow and reap, Right? Now, he says here, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here, which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, the reason I said that is because I want you to realize, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, some of these prophetic words that have been given, because I want you to see what is going on. Even what we're doing here, and what we've been doing here for the last almost a year now, uh, is answered to to some prophetic words, some of which, honestly, I had not recognized until now. In I, get, I, I don't have some of these things written down, but some of them I will be able to write, write down. Some of them are in the back of the uh, DHT manual, and so if you have that, you can go in and read them there. Uh, but some of them also were not written down. I'm going to tell you about two uh, right now that, that we don't have written down, actually, but uh, we're, we're, we'll get them transcribed because we do have them on tape. One was by a, a woman that was in South Africa when we were there, one of the last times we were there. And we were in the back of the church that John Lake founded in 1908. We were there um, at one of, well, I've been there several times before, but this, we had a meeting in the back. We'd, we just had a service, and we went into a back room, and we're meeting. I think we had, had lunch back there, and there was a woman that came up. And we had run into her a time or two, and sweet lady, didn't know how prophetic she was, but then whenever, when we, we, while we were eating, soon right after we stopped, she came up and said, I've got a word for you. And I said, kind of like Dr. Sumrall, I'm like, yeah, okay, you talk and we'll see. You know, I said, I'll judge it and then we'll go from there. She began talking and she began laying these things out. My wife was actually, got her phone out, I think, and recorded it. And in this prophecy, she said, 
and, and I'll show you why I tie this into what's going on right now because we talked about this last week, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> she said, I see you going into this room and opening this old chest, like the type that they used to carry. Uh, these call them, call them steamer trunks back in the day that they would carry them, uh, huge trunks that they would travel with. And she said, I see you opening this old chest and pulling out these clothes that were very neatly folded and they were all really old white clothes, but they were perfectly folded and perfectly clean and pure white. And she said, and you're taking these out and she said, but they're very old, but they look brand new. And she said, you start taking these things out, start taking these things out. And she said, and you're taking these clothes out and as you take them out, you're putting them up to these people and you're helping people get dressed in these white clothes and these old, old clothes. Well, as I was looking at this, as I'm last night even, matter of fact, started thinking of all these things together and she said, and these old clothes, and she said, and there's, there's things that you're bringing out and she said, and it took you, I think she said, yeah, she said, and it took you, you had two keys that you were using to open this trunk. Okay, so I'm kind of listening and, you know, seeing what's going on. Well, last week we talked about the kingdom. And Jesus said that every scribe that is instructed in the kingdom brings forth treasures both old and new. So all this stuff started coming together. Well, about three months, maybe not even that long, after we saw this woman. And that was essentially, there was more detail, more things to it, but essentially that was the, the vision that she had, the prophecy. So then shortly after that, a couple of months later, we were in Denver, Colorado at a meeting. I had gone over to a meeting. We were having our JGLM Board of Directors meeting for the year that we got together. Most of my directors lived there in the Denver area. So I went up there and we spent about, well, spent a full week uh, in one of our directors' homes, getting up in the morning, talking till evening, going over things, what God was doing, where he was taking JGLM, different aspects of things. And it was a great time. It was a really a great time just to fellowship. And so one night they said, well, the church that we've been working with up there uh, was having a meeting on a weekend, and I believe the guy's name is David Wagner. Yeah, that rings a bell to me. He's, he's a prophet. And I'd never heard of him, didn't know anything about him, didn't, didn't know anything. And so we go into this meeting, and we got the entire JJ and Board of Directors in one pew. Well, actually, we're in two pews, and sitting there. And we're kind of right in the center, back a little bit. And this man is beginning to minister. And finally, he says, uh, I understand we have the uh, John G. Lake Ministries uh, Board of Directors here. Okay, I don't, don't know where he got the information or who told him, but he said, um, all right, if you would, he said, if I could, if I could just get all of y'all to come forward, if you could just come forward. And we've been in places where people call us out or, or but that knew of us or whatever, and they would call us out and lay hands on us and try to give us a double portion of this or, you know, just new mantle of John Lake and all this different kind of stuff. And usually when they do that, it is, you've heard of guilt by association? Well, a lot of times it's, you know, photo op by association. I mean, they'll, they'll call you out so they can say, well, yeah, he's having miracles and I laid hands on him and it happened after I laid hands on him. That kind of stuff goes on where people want to be seen as somebody that helped start something. So I'm just not big on that. Right, and I remember I was sitting on the very end, and my wife's sitting next to me, and got all of our board of directors there. And I, you know, I've, I've said before, I can be extremely stubborn. Okay, uh, it's sanctified perseverance now, but it was stubborn whenever I was younger. And so now I was, um, so I was sitting there, and he said, if I can get all of y'all to come up, just ever get everybody come on up, just come up here. And so I'm sitting there, and they kind of look at me, and I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm like. Not going up. Mm, not going to do it. And then the pastor is sitting on the other side, and he turns and looks at me, and I look at him. I'm like, you know me. I'm not getting up there. I'm not going to do it. And so the, I don't know if you ever realize how awkward that can be, right? The guy says, yeah, if y'all can just, if you can just come right up here and stand. And, you know, 30 seconds of silence is long, okay? And so he just kind of stands there for a few seconds, and nobody's moving. I'm looking around. Everybody's looking. And I got all of my board directors looking at me like, we, we're going to go up? And I'm like, Nope, not going up. Mm -mm, not going to do it. And so it's a long silence. And you can tell a lot about a person how they handle things like that, right? And he's standing there a few seconds. He says, yes, just uh, 
it just the the JJ Lamb board or John Track Ministries board of directors. If you if you will, just just come right up here, right up front here. And he said, because uh, I have a word, I have a word for you. And I'm like, nope, not moving. <laughs> yep. If you're really of God, you'd know that. <laughs> you know, you'd know how I am. You'd know I ain't moving. So I just stopped, and it wasn't wasn't comfortable for anybody, especially for him, I'm sure. But it wasn't comfortable for me either. And so we're sitting there. And I remember what Dr. Sumrall said. He said, if God gives you a word, you have to give it. He said, you have to. And if it doesn't work the way you want to, you will find a way to deliver that word because you have to. I mean, it, it's, it's there. It's, it's going to be on you till you do. So I'm just sitting there. So then he walked down the aisle right next to me. Stood right, and I'd never met him or anything, but he walked right next to me. And I also don't like people just walking up and laying their hands on me, right? Uh, someone laying hands on you, it is an act of submission for you to, to allow someone to lay hands on you. And I'm very careful about who I submit to. Now, I defer to one another, but I'm very careful about who I submit to one another in the sense of if I don't know you, and if I submit to you to lay hands on me, then that gives you permission to put into me whatever you've got. And if I don't know you, I may not want what you got. Right? So I'm very careful about who I allow to lay hands on me in that situation. <clears throat> now, I know we train people to go out in the world and lay hands on the sick everywhere, and you say, well, what if they were as picky as you? Well, then they probably wouldn't be sick either, and they wouldn't need your hands. So, <clears throat> but um, I, I know, and we're, we're kind of understanding that they don't always know that, okay? So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, well, now we're going to really find out if he's of God, because if he comes and puts his hands on me, I'm probably going to get up and walk out. I mean, I'm just that, I think I say stubborn, but I'm just that, okay? So I'm sitting there, and he walks over, and you could tell he was like almost going to lay hands on me. And when he walked over there, he said, the Lord says, and he stepped back, didn't touch me, which was the first time I was like, okay, this guy might actually hear from God, <laughs> okay? So he began to prophesy, and he said, I see you, and he said, you're supposed to be writing some books, and he talked about these, he mentioned these five books at one point. I thought, okay. And because I'd heard that from this other prophet from like five years before that of these books. And he said, and these books are going to bring forth these two keys. And I'd heard about these two keys just a month, two months before that from this other lady. So all, God is putting all this stuff. So now I'm starting to listen. And I'm starting to say, okay, this guy could be for real. So he goes through this whole thing. He says, and this key is going to open this up, and it's going to bring these things, and it's going to bring forth revelation. He said, and you're going to look at this, and you're going to think, can this be true? And he said, you're going to bring it out. And there's a lot more details to it. Like I said, I don't have it written down that I can show it to you, but I will get it written, uh, transcribed out and put out. So then when he finishes, he goes back over, and he says, okay, we're going to begin to minister. And he started, he said, if you need healing, you need uh, different things come forward. And it was very awkward because I never really acknowledged anything, just kind of sat there and listened to what was going on. I said, okay. So then he goes back, and when he goes back, he starts to minister to people, and he says, very gracious of him. I mean, ama amazing, amazing grace, uh, amazing graciousness in him. Because he said, uh, if I can, I'm, I'm going to get, uh, I think he even called my name, Bro Brother Curry, Brother Blake, or something like that. He said, to come up and help me minister healing. Well, very honestly, if, I'd just done it to somebody. I probably wouldn't invite them up to help me minister healing. But he did. And so I went up there, and when I did, when I got up there, he handed me the microphone and said, would you pray for these people? And I said, yeah. And I said, before I do, though, I want you all to know this man's of God. I said, and I want you to know that what when I sat there, I said, I wasn't trying to be rude or mean or anything. But And I gave him some of the things. I said, this is the way I was raised spiritually. This is who I sat under. This is how we did things. And I said, and very honestly, I said, the way he handled that proved to me that he was of God because he didn't lay hands on me. He, he didn't uh, do certain things, yet he had to get that word out. And he's standing there going, yeah, and started laughing. And, and I said, and so he did. He found a way to get it out, even though I didn't come forward and didn't uh, do what he wanted to do. He still had to deliver that word. And I said, and it was right. And so we just kind of went through these things. And so I said, so what he has said is exactly right. He hears from God. And I told about the details. I told about the lady uh, in South Africa. So now I'm just verifying pretty much everything, you know, his whole ministry. <clears throat> and so we went through all that. Now, I went through all of that to get to this. And I'm going to go back. And all of this happened before those two things did. Right? So are you totally confused now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just like watching a show, you know, where they have to go back. And, you, you know, they go back and they have the 
either the yeah flashbacks of what's going on. So you know you you can keep up with this, right? Yeah. Now, so here's a prophecy that was given to me, and I'm going to read. And it's, there's several different parts. I probably won't read all of it, but I'm going to read the parts that apply now, especially. But he says, um, first off, uh, he says, son, you have some you have some things set before me that have been a cry in your heart for a number of years that you've not voiced or shared with other people, but you're going to begin to see that the answers that I have for you are going to become a real living revelation to you. You have had a measure of revelation, even in healing, but I'm taking you to deeper places of revelation that is even going to begin to blow your mind. But as it comes forth, you are going to say, God, this is what I've been crying out for. This is what I've been looking for. And even as the books are written, as here he is again talking about, I'm supposed to be writing these books, each will be a piece to the puzzle that you are trying to solve. Now think about that. Only God can say something like that, that you're going to write books and the, the book is going to be a piece of a puzzle that you're trying to solve. Well, that shows that the books are going to be by revelation and not by knowledge per se. Okay. He says, <clears throat> you have been putting pieces together here and pieces together there. You'll begin to see the pieces all coming together in greater unity. And even as you step out into deeper places of healing and step into places where you will see even more people raised from the dead just by you walking past them. Son, there are also some relational things that you've set before me that I am going to begin to resurrect from those dead places and bring into a place of life and purpose and destiny in me. And even those people that you thought would never come into the kingdom will come in and they will even work alongside of you. Those of whom many years ago did not understand what you were doing. They turned and walked away. This is the day of reconciliation. This is the day of restitution. This is the day where you will begin to see them coming back to you, repenting for their attitude and repenting for the fact that they misunderstood, that they misunderstood, and they will ask you to mentor them and train them and equip them. Now, if you take this part and go back to the prophecy that Dr. Lake gave, one of the things in there it says that we would not be understood or accepted by our brethren, Amen. and that would be, we would be rejected by our brethren. Well, we've we've seen clear cases of that. Uh, outright blatant um, I want to say almost like being ignored in a sense and it's actually funny to watch because it is the fulfillment of prophecy so it's you know kind of hard to get offended if it's fulfilling prophecy right so <clears throat> he says son you will raise up many people who will be the reproducers of reproducers and you will see that the work will be a quick work and it will be an even quicker work than you have had to labor to do because you have plowed the ground and made the way, and now is the time for that next generation to step in. Even as, now when he talks about, you have to also see the as aspect that years ago, um, a word was given that one of the reasons why God chose us and uses us is because we would raise our children correctly. And that he would bring forth, and that even as we buried one physical child, that God would bring forth spiritual children. And that he would bring forth spiritual children and spiritual grandchildren even into our ministry and life. So a lot of this goes together. He says, even as your grandchildren begin to step into places of healing, you will see healing and deliverance and great victory even in nations and will, will come forth from the words of your grandchildren because of the anointing that's upon them, will be more than double of what is upon you. It'll be greater than even you would envision. But son, it will be greater than all that you have ever wanted. For surely says the Lord, son, this is a season, a time that you're coming into, that you are going to reap the harvest of seeds that you have sown in your late teens and early 20s. The roots of the seeds that you have sown have grown and become this huge thing. And it is a blessing that it's not only going to impact you in your soul, mind, body, and spirit. I see it being something that will restore the energy and restore the things in the areas where you may have grown tired. Part of the benefit and the reaping of the harvest that you are getting is a physical reaping even in your body's rejuvenation. But also where you have seen miracles with people in the physical realm and seen miracles happen before your eyes. So all this is going to be an increase in rejuvenation. The Lord says, son... I'm going to supernaturally bring money and finances into your life. I see someone coming into your life that's of great financial stature that will be connected with your ministry and your call and your purpose and your plan. He will know the root of what you're trying to do in the ministry and the obedience that you walk in with the Father. The Lord says, son, this person is going to be someone that supports you in whatever you need. And he goes on, well, it just says, I see checks after checks being written, finances being there. Well, are, are you here today? 
I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> the Lord says, son, I'm opening new doors for your family. Even as your family starts to travel more and more with you, the Lord says, son, I'm bringing a new, deeper, fresh re relationship between your family and what is going to happen. And I see a zeal within your children rising up, a passion to receive and uh, plowing and to see their eyes being open to the sacrifices you have made throughout your life where you have set things aside, where you have wanted different things at different times. And you said, Lord, I receive your will and I'm going to be obedient to you no matter what it is that I set aside right now. I see your family's appreciation growing for you, see, uh, for seeing your sacrifices and what it is that you've given up and sacrificed. The Lord says, even though you have done that since you were a teen, this is the time when you're going to reap the harvest, not only financially, but physically and relationally with your family. I see where there has been estrangement between family members where they have had questions and the answers have not been right according to what they wanted to hear. But the Lord says, son, you're going to be back in that situation again. And son, just lay it all on the line with them. And I see the situation turning around and even them doing the partnering in with you that you thought would never have been possible because of the way they presented themselves. Son, sit back, just receive from me. This is a time of joy. This is a time of reaping the harvest for the seed sown and the sacrifices made. He says, <clears throat> trying to go on here the lord says son receive it sit back and relax i'm going to bless you i'm going to bring what you need this is a time to ask for even greater or even great great bigger things than you can imagine i don't know if it's airplanes or what it is that comes into the ministry but the lord says now is a time to ask for that but it is in the spirit that now is a time for the release of that the lord says son i am there for you and i'm going to bring it now i'm going to bring it and now is the time for the reaping of the harvest so you can keep hearing this thing over and over and over again my son, I sense the urgency within your spirit because I have placed that urgency there. Again, this goes back to a prophecy that was given by Dr. Lake where it talks about what is put in you in this urgency. Even though, son, there are things that you have done that no one else has done, there are still things you know you can do. There are even teachings that you have done that you have not even released yet because in your study of the people that walked with me 20, 30, or 40 years, 100 years ago, you saw some things that are not ready to be revealed yet. Son, now is the time to reveal those teachings. Now is the time to reveal those revelations. And even through the disappointments, and even though the disappointments in your relationship has come about here in the last two years, it's going to be taken care of. It is not going to, be, to have to be a burden on you. Son, release that burden. It's not your burden. My son, that is my burden. I took that burden from off your shoulders, and I'm taking it off your shoulders now. Son, you're a man of integrity. You have people that have been looking at you for the past five years that are not sure where, you've, where you are standing, but now they are sure where you're standing, and now your finances will be coming in, and the plane that was spoken of will be brought to you because, son, your time in travel has to be decreased, and your time teaching has to be increased, and that's the way it's going to be done. You will be going not just from country to country, but you will be going from nation to nation. You will get phone calls from presidents and princes wanting you to come to their nations. They will be Muslim nations. They will be radical nations. They will be nations that don't even know who Jesus is, but they're going to be hearing from you and, and other people that they trust, and they have some things and issues and physical healings that need to be healed. You will be able to turn around nations and make decisions in the spirit that will change the political direction of different nations. Now, this is very similar to what Dr. Simrall also walked in. Although you're going to be looking for things to do further, I will have people walking side by side with you. It has been spoken before that your children and grandchildren will be doing marvelous works. It will, it will set within you the desire to keep doing more, but there are times when I will hold the reins on you and will pull you back. And because if you go too quickly, you'll be bypassing people. There are things that have to come across your path slowly. The calling on your life will be increased and your strength, your vitality, and purpose will be revealed. I have a purpose for you that's going to be revealed. You have had a taste of it. I've not told you about it, but you have sensed in the spirit that I'm going to speak to you. When I speak those words and I give you that unction, there is going to be a quick move, and you will be staying within a country for three months, and during that stay, there will be a change within that country that you will know what your new calling is and that you will know what needs to be done. I've searched the whole earth through. I've, come, I've gone to places with you. I've found your heart. I've seen your heart. I know your heart is true. For my eyes are upon you, my son. I've come to support you. 
I'm clothing you this day, says the Lord, for my angels have come to you. I'm strengthening you. I'm restoring you. I'm causing you to be strong. You will have what you need. You will ask what you need. You will have what you need, says the Lord. Look up and see my face. Look up and see my face, for you have my attention. You have my voice. You have my will. You will have my way. Look up, says the Lord your God, for I have shaken the systems of man. I am enabling you, my son. Look now and see, for I am, for I have redeemed, and, and I am yours this day. You are mine in every way. You have given your heart. Now I give you my best. I give you my best, says the Lord. The Lord says, just as I have searched and looked and looked and looked and found you, I am also jealous for you, says the Lord. And you're not even jealous for yourself and the other ministries, with other ministries. And the competition thing has not taken root in your heart. And I'm pleased with your heart and how you have kept the garden of your heart and the garden with the weeds being torn out so that the weeds do not go down into any kind of bitterness or infection within, says the Lord. And then he says, the Lord says, son, I'm going to be taking you to what it looks like to you. God, is this necessary? Don't argue with me, son. See, he knows me pretty well. <laughs> I'm giving, now, because he's talking about a particular thing, and this, this would definitely have to deal with you, okay? <clears throat> Don't argue with me, son. I'm giving you that land that is prime where people will say, oh, no, this just can't be. This is too prime a piece of land for people to build a house on. You built my house, and I'll build your house. The plans are going to be there. There's going to be, there's going to be um, yeah, it'll be timely given. You'll know what to do with it. The Lord says, not only will it be will there will it be a home, but there will be provision for the training center. The Lord says, you go to people, and now I'm bringing them to you. You've been free to give out that which I've given to you, and I'm giving you more. You can't even imagine the depths, the mysteries, and the keys that are going to be coming to you. I'll bring the entire family, and they will have a piece that will enable, because I will give them sharpening tools. I'm taking the scales off the eyes of some. There will be greater vision and acuity, and you will be surprised. Yes, you will marvel, because you thought, can this happen? And the Lord will say, you better believe it. This season is good. The season is fast. This season is for the future. You will see this season for, is for the very thing that I placed in your heart. It's bigger. It's more, because you just can't see it all. Doctors are going to begin to come and ask how to cure a specific disease or illness because they've heard of your reputation as a doctor and that all these people are healed. As they come and ask you how you would treat or cure this, God will give you the medical terminology that will surprise you because you aren't familiar with the words. They will sense or feel that you have the information and as they are open to receive it, you will say, let me show you a better way and you're going to bring many of the medical profession into the kingdom of God as you do that. My son, even as you set your feet on this property, it was where we went to minister, I began to do a deepening work in your midst of your heart, and I'm doing an enlarging work in the midst of your spirit. You have deposited a thing here because of the earnest of the multiplication getting ready to happen. For surely you have come into the prophets, and even this day you are receiving the mantle of prophet, and you will prophesy more than you thought was possible, and you will have dreams and visions that are going to begin to open up to you. There will be third heaven revelations like John the Revelator, I will cause you to be caught away in measures of my spirit that are even unfathomable in your mind that you thought could be possible. For this is the season I'm opening up the gate of divine revelation and you will see a release of my spirit to show himself to you in a way that you have not seen. I'm opening your eyes. I'm opening up your heart. I'm opening up your spirit. And this day my divine deposit is going within. Now even as you put the seed in the ground and there has been a measure of dying for you though through not only to get here but to process what had to happen here at the platform. It was on a platform with other people around. He said, this has been a springboard, and you will begin to count down. And then he counted down, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and we're writing down. And he said, for surely it is established in my word. I tell my secrets to my prophets. I tell you now that which I tell you secretly, that which I read to you secretly, that which has been behind closed doors and hidden for a season will burst open and reveal by my spirit, and you will see a worldwide impact. You have stepped into a worldwide thrust of my spirit going forth, sent by the prophets, even of the nations. You'll begin to release a demonstration of my spirit that is beyond your imagination. Son, I'm partnering with you in this hour because the last days are coming quickly. I'm calling my bride forth and I'm preparing my warriors in this hour. I'm going to put a trumpet to your mouth for surely within the midst of you, I put an Amos 7 plumb line. I actually had to go in and study that. 
I have put within the midst of you a line of demarcation. I put within you, within the midst of you, my spirit of truth. Now it will come out with forcefulness. You will be in a situation where you will speak words that will come out of your spirit that you will want to put back in your mouth. Okay, that has happened actually many times. The Lord says, now this next part is probably the hardest thing for me to believe or was the hardest thing for me to believe. He says, the Lord says, don't hinder the process of what I'm going to do through you in this hour. I'm going to cause you to be a man that will articulate in a way that will astound you. For surely the command of the English language, the pearls and poetic ability that comes out of your mouth will even be a shock to you. Well, it certainly will be. <laughs> if I can articulate the English language, that would be truly a work of God. Amen. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to show you signs and wonders of my love. I'm going to show you signs and wonders of my heart. He said, I spoke to you and said I would give you, give to you some hidden mysteries and there have been some measure of that come forth within the midst of your life. This has not been the fullness. There is getting ready to open up to you revelation that will reveal, that will reveal to you the armies of my heavenly realms. I'm going to show you my battle strategies and plans. I'm going to give you, as it were, CIA secret information that will reveal what I'm going to be doing. Son, you will go forth establishing a thing where your foot will trod. There will I establish my kingdom. Son, this thing will be bigger, broader, stronger, higher, and greater than you can possibly think in your mind. For this is my heart, not just for you, but my heart through you and to others. I'm going to bring round you people of divine revelation, those who are raising up as apostolic prophetic authority in this hour, and you're going to link arms. There will be a gathering of eagles. <clears throat> there will be a rising up in my, of my divine last day's Ark of the Covenant, and there will be a shouldering of the priesthood that will come underneath the Ark of the Covenant. And you will begin to demonstrate some wonders of the fulfillment of my divine plan that was established in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. Remember, there's that thing old and new again. <clears throat> and it is a heart cry of the proclaiming of the soon coming king. There is coming a royalty upon your head and shoulders. I'm clothing you. You have no idea what the garment looks like. There's that first mention of garment we are talking about earlier. Son, as I begin to reveal the demonstration of this to your spirit, you'll begin to weep and cry at the glory of my mighty mysteries. For surely you have no idea what my heaven and my kingdom of in fullness is like. I'm getting ready to pull back the veil. I'm getting ready to pull back the eyes. I'm getting ready to show you some things that you've cried out for. You will see this in the thrusting of the wings of the eagle that will begin to spread and begin to soar with heights in me. You will demonstrate that ability of discernment that you've been asking for. It will settle and rise in your heart and spirit like it has not happened before. This is the day that I am standing up in the midst of my throne. I, am, I have told you that I am sending you on a journey. I have called you a mighty warrior. I am raising you up as a general. I am also telling you right now the power that I have in the midst of me is to establish, to dethrone, enthrone, to release and bind, to establish new developmental orders of government and tear down old forms of government is being put in your hand. A sickle is being put in your right hand. There's going to come visitations to you personally, things I'm going to do that are private experiences between you and me. There will come the appearance of angels, be a revelation of seeing me. There will come the revelation of seeing the divine order of, of seeing heaven. There'll be moments when you will feel like saying, oh God, this is so majestic, so beautiful, and so huge. I don't want to leave. I just want to stay here. The Lord says, son, I have a work for you to do. I have a commission that's being placed upon you. I have a release that is coming forth out of the midst of you. There will be a joining of family. There will be a joining of teams. You have to remember all this was given in 2003, before we were doing life teams, before, uh, before a lot of the things were actually established. <clears throat> For surely it is time to expand the tent pegs. It's time to enlarge the tent to establish the fullness of it. This is the hour in which I'm raising up my eternal government. I'm releasing to men and women the mantle, the scepter, and the authority in this hour to establish my kingdom in the midst of the hurling of hell itself. Now, son, I'm causing you to come to a place of full stature. Now, those in the Bible school especially have been hearing about full stature, fullness of stature growing up. To standing up tall and straight as an ambassador of royalty for me, for even as you come to the house of prophets, you will leave this place with my cornerstone put in place in your spirit. I've set the foundation. I'm getting ready to ramp up the beams and build the building. For it is an appointed time and season and a time to cross over and move through the gate. I'm releasing a new dispensation. He says there is coming a fast change and a ripping of the wineskins. That's a second and third party revelation that's had a measure of fire and difficulty to it. But I'm releasing an enabling of, adjust, of adjusting and grace that is supernatural. There will be a visitation that will draw you together for the purposes of my ordained eternal destiny. 
for all that will cause you to flow in harmony with divine orchestration, releasing a new song. All this you have to kind of go through and look at, but even this idea of releasing a new song, every move of God has a song and it has its own sound. And very honestly, that has been the one thing that we have been lacking that has been able to take the words of this message and put into song so that we don't have to go and sing the old songs, but the new songs would come forth and the new songs take people to the next, literally the next higher level of revelation. And he says, for this is the hour, son, for you to rise and proclaim. This is the hour for you to rise and declare. It's the hour for you to set in order and to position. For surely I placed upon you the apostolic authority of the last day's prophet apostle. I'm releasing inside of your heart. I'm releasing within you right now a supernatural divine network because my hand is releasing you to a place of demonstration that I might be able to raise up in my throne. For I am standing now and I am with you and I put my mind in you. I place my purposes in your heart and you shall accomplish my will. You will lead this last day army into battle, into victory. Your time is now at hand. You will continue to travel, but you shall travel from a base. The training center shall be your launching place. You will produce those who will also be mighty warriors. You must not fear. You must not back off. You must move forward. You must attack, attack, attack. Now that's code. Okay. And it's funny that God would use that because not a lot of people would catch that. But the words attack, attack, attack was in my life. That was a direct quote from General George S. Patton Jr. He said, when in doubt, attack, attack, attack. And so whenever this person said this, it was like, oh, yeah, okay. Because I'd had questions about the path I was on, and these just confirmed some of these things. There will come a burst, as it were, of writing, and the books you produce will change dead traditional Christianity into a living, practical lifestyle that will produce victory. Now, <clears throat> there's more on this. I'm not going to read it all right now. But there are other pages of this, and some of the things that actually... Uh, talks more about the revelation that is coming forth. And actually, I will tell you, in the last couple of days in the Bible school, uh, <clears throat> we have completely broke the mold as far as teaching courses like we planned to, right? And instead, we kind of stuck with one thing. Instead of following through the course, we have stayed on the new man. And <clears throat> we've been teaching this new man to the Bible school students here and just going through it and going through it. And it's kind of funny because half the time we will uh, read a scripture, start to, to comment on it, and then immediately, sometimes it's like, how did you get that out of that scripture? Well, I wasn't trying to get that out of that scripture. right? It was revelation coming forth that we have since went back and checked out. <clears throat> this is part of that revelational process. That as we move forward, there's a lot of things that are beginning to happen, even here in the ministry and where we're going um, <clears throat> worldwide now. Uh, invitations to some other countries for some conferences and things like that that are going to be major aspects of what we're going to be doing. The reason I'm telling you all this is because, like I said before, this is, if, if you're, well, like I said, if you're uh, you know, hooked to this wagon, it's kind of where you're going. And I think it's only fitting that you know where you're going. And we'll always have people that come in, come in for ministry, come in to be prayed for. That, that's, that's just a given. At the same time, you heard a lot of what was said in this had to do with the next generation. And now, I believe that that does have to do with an age, you know, next generation. But I also believe that to me, whenever someone, because God usually speaks to a person in language that they get. <clears throat> and for me, I was raised up, well, raised up, uh, when I was in martial arts, <clears throat> I, I had wanted to study directly under Bruce Lee. Well, by the time I started my studies, he had passed away. So all I could do was find his students to train under, and so I went and found them. Okay, the whole terminology in going and training under them was that the closest I could get to Bruce was a second generation. So the idea, when I hear second generation, it has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with even when it talks about grandchildren, things like this. I do believe it has to do with my grandchildren. I believe it is for them. But I also believe that it also talks about spiritual children, spiritual grandchildren. And I believe that it talks about the next generation 
<clears throat> being the second generation of whoever gets this message. In other words, if, if God pours it through me, then you would be the second generation, regardless of who you are. That, do you understand that? I mean, does that make sense? So I believe that's what's going forth. Now, we will always have people come in that just want to hear. They just want to go to church on Sunday. They come in, maybe they like the message or they like the overall message or something. They like something, so they keep coming back. But they never get involved. You know, they just show up and leave. I mean, that's about it. We will always minister to them, and, and we wouldn't obviously wouldn't treat them any different than we'd do anybody else. But I also have to make sure that, you know, if you ever watch a, a, a mama bird feed the baby bird, it's the one that sticks its head up the farthest with the mouth open and gets fed first. And so I have to be very, uh, how can I say it, judicial <laughs> in how I spend my time. And so now we will share with anybody, we'll talk with anybody, I meet with people, I go to eat with people, and just fellowship, and that's always good, and I enjoy it. But at the same time, <clears throat> The purpose of this place is not just to give people a place to come to. The purpose of this place is to train up people so that people don't feel like they always have to get a hold of me. Amen. Right? I mean, that's until we get that taken care of, uh, this is still going to be a man centered thing. And I'm, that's definitely not what we're trying to do. We really want this to be Christ centered so that, you, so that people can realize if I can get a hold of any of those people, they can get the job done. That's, that's the purpose, is to grow up believers. Now, I will tell you, and you can ask anybody around here, if you hang around very much, we'll put you to work, right? That, that doesn't mean a paycheck from me or the ministry. That means we will find things in the kingdom of God that need to be done and see if you'll do them, right? Now, if you do them, God will pay you. He'll take care of you, right? God, God, doesn't, God doesn't rip people off, okay? If, if, you, if you work for God, he takes care of you. It's just the way it is. Now, but if you, the whole idea here is to get people active. Most of you, what you're looking for, you won't ever learn by sitting there. Because what you're looking, you've already heard the message. You've already heard what you need to know. What you, what you need, what you think you need to learn now, you're going to learn by doing it. That's where 90% of my growth came from, was not just what I'd read, but what I started putting into practice. And so we will have opportunities uh, for you to get involved and for you to, to step up and actually be put into, uh, I'm not going to say position, but put into a place where you can be used of God. It, going out on the uh, Sunday afternoons on the Feeding Jesus, that's a primary place. That's a great birthing place for you to minister to people. Going to the uh, senior care facilities, great place. Now, the going out to the Feeding Jesus where we go out and take care of people and feed them, clothe them, talk to them, minister to them, pray for them. That's good because it gives you a chance to practice. You know, in the business world, they call that cold calling, right? You just kind of walk up to a person, there it is. The senior care facility is the same way, but you can also establish a relationship where you actually start to pastor these people and you start to make it, you know, finding out what they need and bringing that to them and making relationships with them because, you know, as Alondra said before, a lot of these people honestly, are very close to death, and they'll never see outside that building that they're in. And so it's very important that we make sure that they know Jesus as their Lord. And so this is a vital thing. Literally, same thing on the, on the streets. People die every day. And so we need to make sure that we are touching lives. This is your chance. It's not all about pulpit ministry. It's not about you having a title or a business card. It's about you touching lives anywhere and everywhere. And that is the essence of it. Now, my job here especially, is to train you up. And this is a, the first chance we've ever had, really, to literally train people up kind of from start to finish. And God is giving us the information and the plan and what we need to get that done. We are, I, I'll tell you just very plainly, I cannot do all that I need to do. And so we need people to take on things and to start being, you know, available to do things, and that's part of the growth. This is not, you know, if you just want to, you know, song and dance and show for your money, you know, you can either go to a movie theater or, you know, any one of a hundred other churches, but that's not what we're about. And so a lot of things around here don't look all polished and professional, but that's because we actually are trying to really touch lives 
with the power of God. And so um, a lot of these things as we move into them, those of you that have been around and that we've been talking to, you can tell a lot of these things that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, you can see in these prophetic words. Now, a lot of this stuff I didn't even put together. I didn't even, didn't even try to put them together until even last night I was looking at this and, and thinking about some of these things. Now, these keys that we've been talking about, literally, and, and that's, it, it kept coming up over and over again, but these keys predominantly, there's more than one, more than two, but the two primary ones that God has given us are the keys that open up the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and these keys are very simple. <clears throat> to you, you're not, they may not seem you know, dramatic, but it's because you're used to them now. But if you take what you've been hearing, even here or on by CD or DVD, uh, any of our material over the last couple of years, and you take that, honestly, to most other church congregations, if you presented that to them, it would be revelation to them. And in many cases, they would absolutely just stop and back off and go, whoa, that's so far out there. Until we started presenting healing as warfare, it was not presented as warfare. That started about 10 years ago. Now it's accepted, not totally, but to a, to a large degree, people are starting to see there's a warfare aspect to it. But the keys that we're talking about here, predominantly, and, and I could look at it from several different ways, but predominantly have to do with dominion, authority, as we would say. But I would say if I had to pick two, because dominion and authority kind of run together. But I would say that at this point, at what we're looking at, the two main keys that we have brought to people really is the aspect of dominion, right? But also just an aspect of obedience of the word. Just do it. You know, just what it says, just do what it says. And so, but most people don't think they can because they don't think they have the authority or don't think they have that level of, of, of responsibility. So the other aspect is the two things that we have taught people, and this is what I hear at almost every DHT and pretty much everywhere else, is that we bring a level of freedom, a level of life, but we bring this dominion, this authority aspect, but we also bring a responsibility that we are our brother's keeper. And that goes all the way from food and clothing all the way to getting them healed, getting them born again. And, and I mean, it's a, it's a full realm that we have to see that we are members of this kingdom, that we are part of this kingdom, and that wherever we go, the kingdom is advanced. And so we, as, as a body here, we have to begin seeing ourselves as a kingdom outpost, as a kingdom, as a colony of kingdom saints, citizens, and that it's not all going to look all spiritual, but there is a political aspect. Do you realize that in uh, Isaiah, it says that to us a child is given, and then on that it says, and on his shoulders shall be the government. It does not say on his shoulders shall be a new religion. It says on his shoulders will be the government, and that government is the kingdom of God. And it is a different type of government, which is exactly what this person while ago, when I was reading, he said there's a new government, a new way of moving into things that I'm beginning to bring forth and reveal to you. And it is very simple, that it is the kingdom of God and operating in that kingdom and not operating in under natural you know, principles that we have in this world. So with us in this, in this kingdom, these keys have been given to us. These keys. And now, we said last week in Matthew 13, and we're going to be building on these things as we go along. So, you know, if, we, if you can get a hold of last week's message, go through it again. And then get a hold of this one and go through it. Because the keys in this kingdom of understanding these mysteries is that these keys are the keys that open these mysteries. And he made it very clear that these, in, in um, Matthew 13, Jesus said, when he started explaining the parable of the sower, he, remember we made a big point on this, he said, it is what you understand that can't be stolen from you. Well, that understanding is a key. right? So it's not one or two keys. There's a, it, it, actually, the bigger a kingdom is, the more keys there are you know, attached to it. Part of these keys has to do with this understanding. You've got to get understanding. That's why 
I highly encourage you. If I teach something or anybody here teaches anything, if you don't understand it, talk to us. Let us know. I didn't get that. I didn't understand that part. Let us know. The, the whole purpose of me being here. Listen, you're not here to give me a place to preach. Okay? If you weren't here and we didn't have this, I could be preaching anywhere in the world. We got open invitations, thousands, right? I don't need a place to preach. I'm here to sow into your life and to, and to literally to pastor you, to grow you up so that you look, talk, and act like Jesus. But the way you do that is that you have to understand the principles of the kingdom of God. If you don't understand those principles, you will never walk in the fullness. Jesus said over and over again, if you don't understand, and especially with the principle, he said with the parable of the sower, if you don't understand this one, how are you going to understand any of the rest? So we have to understand these things. You have to get understanding. So if you don't understand, don't hesitate. You know, make an appointment. Come in. Let's sit down. Let's talk. And it doesn't have to be just with me. It could be any one of our staff here. They understand this stuff. And so we will get a chance to talk. We will talk with you. If you have a question, write it down. Get it to me. Talk to me. Make an appointment somehow. Don't go with your questions unanswered. Right? Get understanding. And all you're getting, get understanding. Amen? Because once you get understanding, whatever you have understanding about, the devil cannot steal from you. So get understanding. Whether it comes with about healing or the baptism of the Spirit or the kingdom or any area, get understanding. Keep going after it till you get those questions answered. If we have to say the same thing a hundred times different ways, we will do it. Because it's not enough that we preach it. You've got to get it. Amen? Now, listen. Everything... You have to look at all this. We can't just look at it from a point of here's a topic, there's a topic, here's a topic. You know, these are just pieces. That's the way it's been. The church has been too big on just topical preaching and you get pieces and nobody under, well, I can't say nobody. A lot of people don't understand just the overall idea, the overall plan of God. And so the kingdom is what Jesus preached. Okay? He, he, he preached the kingdom and how to walk in that kingdom. And, and then everything he did was an exhibition, a demonstration of how to live in the kingdom. Healing the sick, listen, healing the sick is not a, a gift. Now, I understand there are gifts of healings. I understand that. But it is not, you don't have a gift that you are able to heal, right? You're a believer. Healing is walking in the kingdom, right? That is part, you know, here in America we have... Um, Certain things, and I have to be careful how I say this exactly, because you know we, we look at driving a car sometimes as, as a right. It's not. It's a privilege, right? That's why they give you a license that can be revoked, because it's a privilege, right? If you show yourself to be a danger to you or somebody else. And so, but we have laws, but we also have rights here in, in America, right? We have these rights, and those rights is, this is how we live. And, it, and how we live is the culture. Uh, and there are different ethnic groups that have different cultures within their ethnic group. And yet, all of those cultures come together to make this country. Now, the kingdom of God is like that. In other words, there are all different ways that people do things, but we all have to abide by the same principles. Right? We all live in the same principles, and that, those principles are very simple. Those are the ones that Jesus laid out. Those are the Beatitudes that we talked about last time. He said, this is the attitudes you will be having in the kingdom. He said, if it's not the way it is on earth, the way it is in heaven, fix it. Right? These are principles. We have just things that we take as natural to us. You know, uh, If I'm going to go down the store, I could walk, ride, drive a bicycle, you know, or you know, ride a bicycle or drive a car but I have the right to go, right? And so there is that aspect in the kingdom. We have the right in the kingdom to set the captives free. That, that is a, that's a kingdom principle. We have to change our minds to think in line with kingdom principle. We have to begin thinking. Every person in this room, if you are born again, we have to begin thinking in line that we are ambassadors of a kingdom. We are in a foreign country. You understand? We're ambassadors sent to a foreign country to convince the people how much better it is to live in the kingdom of God than it is to live in the kingdom of darkness. 
Yeah, the people in, in the kingdom of darkness, it's dark. That's why we have to bring light. How do we bring light? Preaching truth, healing the sick, setting the captives free. Why? That's what it's like to live in this kingdom. In this kingdom, there's health. In this kingdom, see, you don't need a health plan. You already got one. See, pe people say that kind of stuff all the time. I see people you know, saying different things about insurances and all that kind of stuff. That stuff doesn't concern me one bit. Why? I got none of it. I got, I got you know, Psalm 91 brought over into Luke 10, 19. Right? That's how I live. So based on that, there are principles in the kingdom of God that it is your right to live a certain way. But you actually have to get used to it. When I go to foreign countries, it, there's a, a period of adjustment when you get there that you have to remember which side of the road to drive on. Right? You have to remember certain how they do certain things. And it's different from how we do them here. And I don't go over there and say, well, you know, back in America, this is how we do it. They don't care. You're not in America. Right? And so now with the kingdom, we have to think according to the kingdom. Now, us, our job is to cause this kingdom that we live in to be established in this new place. This new place being where the kingdom has not been established. But we're talking about in the hearts of people so that it can come out of the lives of people. Right? The first land, the, the first ground you need to take is other people's hearts. You need, to, you need to win their hearts because until you win their hearts, you're not going to see much of the kingdom lived out through their life. We can demonstrate it on them, but it won't be demonstrated through them until we convert them. Amen? So this is, we're talking about colonizing. We're talking about going into a new area and planting the flag of Jesus and causing these people to see truth. And for, but to do that, we have to walk in it. See, we can't walk two sides, you know. Um, you have to understand. I know there are some countries where you can have, you know, dual passports. That's not the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God has one passport, the blood of Jesus, amen? And we need to understand that we walk in this kingdom, and therefore we walk on these principles. But you have to get it drilled into you to the part where you start walking that out, and we start living kingdom, you know. Uh, the other day there was a, I saw a book that said, How the Best Leaders Lead. And I thought, I don't even need to read it. It's called By Example. That's, that's it. I mean, there's a lot of other details there. and I mean, they wrote a whole book on it. But bottom line, it comes down to at some point, you can't just describe it. You have to demonstrate. And so we, have to, we, we as the people of God, have to begin walking this out. Now, I can tell you, the first reaction you're going to get is going to be negative from religious people. That's going to be the first thing. Because you don't act holy enough or, you know, Spiritual enough, put it that way. We, got, we had people get kicked out of some healing rooms. They weren't our healing rooms, but they got kicked out because they said, people said, you're not relying on the Holy Spirit's anointing enough. And I, well, what results were they getting? Oh, people were getting healed left and right. Then they were probably uh, relying on the anointing enough. Amen. right? But it just didn't look the way they wanted it to look. It didn't fit in with their culture. Why? Because their culture is trying to build something that is not biblical. Let me tell you, the more spiritual you get and walk in the kingdom, the more natural you're going to look in how you do these things. You're not going to look weird. You're going to be normal. Whenever, whenever someone says, oh, this is horrible. I just got a phone call and so-and-so is on life support. You're not going to sit there and do the same thing they do. It. Oh, really? Oh, no, that's horrible. That's no, it's going to be natural for you to say, well, get them on the phone. Well, I can't get them on the phone. They're on life support. Okay. Call somebody that's next to them. Okay, when you get them on the phone, say, yeah, you got the phone? Okay, put the phone near them. Just put it near them. Just point it toward them. Okay, and when you hear them, put it, then you say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to wake up, command you to be healed. And they go, okay, are, are you done? Yep, done. And then you're going to go back to eating and being normal. And they're going to sit there and look at you like, that was weird. You know, that was, do, you, do you think that really worked? I mean, don't we need to stop eating and fast? What? Okay, it's too late now too fast. You're already eating, right? It's too late. Okay, Be easy to fast now, see? But we have to realize this is who we are. This has to be normal to you. Until it's normal to you, uh, nobody else is going to want it. They have to see this is part of who you are. When they see you walking this and they go, why, when everybody else got scared and nervous, why didn't you get scared and nervous? Why? Because nothing's going to touch me, right? Yeah, I don't care if, if everything falls apart, I'm going to walk out the mist. I don't care. You know, I firmly believe if, the, if I'd have been at the World Trade Tower on 9-11, I'd have walked out. 
I'd have walked right out. Now, I don't know, you know, either that or it collapsed around me and I'd have been standing there looking at all this stuff in this pile of rubble. I, I don't know. You say that sounds crazy. No, that sounds kingdom. Amen. You have to realize who you are. You are not the same you were before. You have access to power. You have access to knowledge. You have access to wisdom that, honestly, that has not been revealed before. Amen? You are a new creation, a new species. It is vitally different, and you have to realize that. We're not just sinners saved by grace. You get that? You are a new creation, righteous before God. And when you speak, the, the prayers of a righteous man avails much, right? Not the prayers of a sinner saved by grace. You hear that? You are righteous in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, it's not because of what you did, but thank God you got in it, Hallelujah. right? And because you got in it, now you are righteous. Now act righteous. Amen. That's what he, he didn't say, beloved, seek revival. He said, beloved, awake unto righteousness, right? And sin not. In other words, quit wasting your time with stupid stuff like that. Let's get busy about kingdom business. Let's show people what it's like to live in the kingdom. Amen. Because it, it's good in the kingdom, right? Now, what that means is we're going to do things different. We're going to act different, talk different. And, and you ever get around people that, you know, if you get around me and talk cars, I have no clue. I do, you know, you tell, me, you tell me about this thing or that thing or what it is, I don't, I couldn't tell you, you know. And it may impress you, and I'm looking at standing looking at you like, yeah, so. No, don't you understand? This thing's got to, I don't get it. Why? I have no, it's not my world. Right? Well, we need to get that way with the kingdom. We need to get to the point where the kingdom is our world. To where we talk, and people say, well, what are you talking about? What, you don't understand? Here, let me explain it to you. And then you, it, it, it's kind of like this. You know when you, what are you doing? You're throwing out a parable. Why? Right? Because that's the way Jesus taught. And you start to explain the kingdom. Everything's about the kingdom. Everything we're going to be doing here, especially over the next few months, stuff. you're going to hear it more. You're going to see it more. We're going to start living out the kingdom here. You're going to see it functioning in ways that you've never seen it function before. Amen? Because I believe this is the time. Amen. This is the time. This is what we've been waiting for. And very honestly, what I like about this place is that we're not under any type of denominational thumb that we have to do it a certain way. We can just see what the Bible says and do it the way the Bible says it. And by the Spirit of God, we will establish the kingdom of God in this place. And people that come here can walk through those doors and get healed. Amen? Don't even have to get prayed for. Now, that's all good. It's all fine good to pray. But we don't have to do these things. We can just begin to minister the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Y'all got that? Yeah. So, who's coming with me? <laughs> Amen? This is, um, I tell you, after going through some of these, even these prophetic words and things, the hardest thing is to believe that there are prophetic words that God knows you well enough that he can speak this to you and say, this is what I have for you. Now, but I guarantee you the own. listen, if I had not answered the call to ministry and stepped out when everybody told me that, number one, I wasn't fit for ministry or couldn't be used of God or anything, I've heard all that stuff. If I had not stepped out and gone, I would not have been on that platform the day that God had this word for me. There, so what, every step you take today puts you somewhere else tomorrow. You know, it's like I said the other day, I think... Uh, John David brought it to my attention. I made a statement. I said, when people say, you know, that's never been done before. Well, nothing's been done before until you do it. You know? So basically, that's what it comes down to. So I think it's time that we do some things that's never been done before. Amen? Amen. And let the world marvel at it and say, how did y'all do that? And we just say, that's just kingdom. That's just normal. This is how we live. Amen? Yeah. All right, let's all stand up. How many of y'all appreciated that worship this morning? That was good, huh? Wasn't that good? Yep. And, and we were talking about it. He, he, Kyle had actually sent me a text this morning and said, let's do it this way. And I said, yep, that's good. Why? Because we need to do it differently. You know, I'm all for that. Let's, let's see uh, what God has for us. And let's see where we go with it. Because, um, listen, God is so creative oh, yeah. that we have not even scratched the surface of his creativity. Amen? Yeah. And so, and what I like about it too is it had more body ministry in it, more interactive, getting you active. So, um, we're going to start doing that more and more along these lines. And so we are wide open to some of these things and, and wanting the Spirit of God to move in that. So right now we're going to pray. First off, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord, you need to, right? He died for you. 
He bore your sins. He bore your iniquities. He bore your sicknesses, your diseases. And basically everything that made you the person that nobody likes, he bore all that, all right? The person that you didn't like, he bore all that. All the things that hurt you and hurt and cause you sometimes to hurt others, he bore all those. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can go in that door. <laughs> That's why it's a door. You can go. <laughs> Set the character is free. There you go. <laughs> so, and we we love children. I tell you, I, I love children. That, that that kind of stuff doesn't bother me one bit. I love them. So, um, you know, if there was a baby in here, I'd be holding it probably during the whole service. So, I did that once up in uh, Delaware, and was holding the baby so long that when I handed back, my arm was so cramped up I had to just kind of leave it there for a little I thought somebody's going to come pray for me to you know reach forth your hand or something you know um, and so we're going to um, well you just need to know Jesus like I said you need to know Jesus now I'm not going to give you a, a, some formula I'm not necessarily against that but the key is just simply this you just need to tell him you want him that you need him that you know that your life uh, has not been what God wanted your life to be and that Matter of fact, I would even tell you that if you are under addiction to anything, that God will set you free because of the blood of Jesus, because of those stripes, he will absolutely set you free. Now, and you, you say, well, you know, I just can't, can't imagine that. Well, you don't have to. It's one step at a time. You know, you step inside the kingdom, he'll set you free. You just make that step toward him. It's not a matter of, of you uh, having to, you know, fix anything. When you step into the kingdom, you get fixed. It's that simple. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to him. You come to him, he does the cleaning. Amen? You just get in. That's all that counts. Just get in, right? So right now, if, uh, if that is you, or if you're watching by internet, then right now, just, just let him know. Like I said, I'm not going to give you a, a formula. Just let him know. I want you to be my Savior. You died for me, and I accept that you were dead, you were buried, and you were raised again the third day, and whenever you raised up, you raised me up with you, and now you're in my heart, and I'm in yours, and I'm your child, and you are my Lord, and I will do what you say to do. That's that simple. You said, well, yeah, I've tried it before and just messed up. Yep, well, guess what? There's always another day. Right? I've tried things many, many times, and finally it stuck. Right? So this could be your day that it sticks. Amen? Amen. So just, just as we begin to pray, just, uh, just let him know how you feel about it. If you need to be filled with the Spirit of God to a degree that maybe you've never experienced before, uh, what we generally call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is God coming to dwell in you in power to endue you so that you can actually minister by the Spirit and by the power of God. And so if that is you and you have not received that, then even right now just begin to tell Him that you want that filling, that you want uh, to be filled to overflowing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He will speak to you in other languages. It's amazing. You say, how does that happen? I can't explain it. It just does. Right, uh, it is God speaking through you. So it's not a, it's not you doing it. It is Him doing it through you. It's amazing. So if that, and He says all you gotta do is ask, and He'll give it. So, third thing, if you need healing in your body, now I'll be glad to minister to you at the end. But if you are, especially if you are a believer, the same Spirit that's in me that would that would heal you, is in you. And so the key is, you just have to know that. And if you, if you come to me for healing, you, then you obviously believe in healing. And that's really all you have to know. And so from there, you just have to decide, it's for me, just like getting born again. You just say, that what he did, he did for me. And so you just take that, and then uh, you just right then decide, sickness and disease cannot live in me any longer because I belong to Jesus. It's that simple, right? Don't make it hard. Don't make it theology. Jesus didn't come and hang on the cross for correct theology, right? He came and hung on the cross for you as a person. Amen? Amen? So just begin to tell them those things. Now, even now, I'm going to pray for you. So Father, in Jesus' name, right now, right now, that there will be those that are outside of your kingdom that right now take you as their Lord, that they acknowledge you, and that even now, Father, they, they recognize of what Jesus has done and that they become born again, new, starting over, brand new, clean, righteous before you in right standing so father i thank you even now and in jesus name right now that there are believers father in you right now that need and desire to be filled with your holy spirit father i thank you even now that they are filled that they are being filled that they are receiving of your spirit to overflowing 
and that you begin to speak through them in other languages. Father, we thank you for this. Right now, in Jesus' name, Father, we recognize that Jesus, Jesus bore on his body the stripes that was for our healing. It was for us. And we thank you for right now that by his stripes, we were healed, so therefore we are healed. Healed and whole. Sickness and disease, you will leave these people now. Whether in my presence here or by watching by internet or DVD or CD or any, any other form, I say in Jesus' name right now, be healed and whole. Healed and whole right now. In Jesus' name, we set you free. If there are addictions, if there are habits, things that you desire to be freed from, God desires you to be free more than you do. His son didn't die so that you could stay in bondage. His son died so you could be free. So we set you free. We break those bondages. Even now, addictions, habits, wrong thinking, we break those things. In Jesus' name, right now, so be it. Amen. All right, say this with me. Say, Father, Father in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. Your, word is true. your word is true. I believe it. I, believe it. I act upon it. It is fulfilled in my life. It is fulfilled in my life. And because of that, I am born again. Born again. There you go. I am born again. I'm your child. Born of the Spirit. I'm your child. Set free. Filled with your Spirit. Baptized with the Holy Ghost. Filled to overflowing. And I do. Speak to myself, Speak to myself. In, psalms, in psalms, hymns, hymns and spiritual songs. And spiritual songs. I, do I do acknowledge, acknowledge what, is me, what is in me in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. And in him, and in him I, am I am righteous. In him, in him I, am whole. I am whole. In him, in him I am sanctified, I am sanctified set, apart, set apart, decreed, decreed to, be to be your child, your child healthy. Healed, Healed. Whole. whole, sanctified, sanctified. Regenerated. regenerated, justified. justified. I, got it all. I got it all, and it's all coming up in me now. And by His stripes, I am healed, and I'm going to stay that way. Sickness and, Sickness and disease has no right in me, no, right in me. no place in me, no place and it cannot live in me. Live in me. Therefore, Sickness and, disease, sickness and disease, I speak to you now, I to you now. and I command you, and I command you leave, my body, leave my body and never return. And never return. Go, Go. Now, now in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. And, I you, and I thank you, Father, that you always hear me, that you always hear me. and therefore I always have what I ask. And I thank you for it now, and I am an overcomer. I was born to overcome because I, I was born of your spirit, born of, your spirit. Born of the blood, born of the, blood. Born, of the water. born of the water, born of the spirit, born of, the spirit. Born of your word, born of your word. That, incorruptible word. that incorruptible word. And I thank you, and I thank you. That, even that even today, my mind is being renewed. Mind is being renewed. Old, things are passed away. Old things are passed away. All things are of God. All things are of God. They're all new in me. They're real, real. alive, Alive. living, Living. in and through me. And And I thank you for it, Father, Father, that you have given me the ability ability to be redeemed redeemed and to say so. so. I'm redeemed, redeemed. bought back, back. put back into position, position. a righteous, righteous. holy people, people. a royal royal priesthood, set apart unto God. Walking in the kingdom, kingdom. demonstrating the kingdom, kingdom. healing the sick, sick. raising the dead, dead. casting out devils, devils. preaching the gospel, the gospel gospel you said said must be preached preached unto the whole world world before the end can come. come. And I thank you, Father, Father, for the privilege privilege of preaching this gospel. The good news news of your superiority superiority throughout the world. world. Right now, now, I'm in the kingdom. The kingdom kingdom is within me. me. Everywhere I put my foot, foot, 
the kingdom is there. The kingdom is there. Whenever, I reach out my hand, Whenever I reach out my hand, the kingdom is at hand. Well, whoever, I touch, whoever I touch, the kingdom infects, the kingdom infects invades, invades, overtakes, overtakes overcomes, overcomes, and literally, and literally inhabits, inhabits in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. I, thank you, I thank you, Father, that you have prepared, you have prepared people, people to hear me, to hear me and, to me, and to receive me and to receive the word I have. And, to the word I have. and I thank you that they receive it with joy and that they be born again that they be healed and whole through your son Jesus so be it in Jesus name amen well God bless you amen that's how you stir that stuff up amen and that's what our students do here every morning they go through things like this and just put the scriptures out and get it alive in them and get it speaking out you should do this every morning, right? You should do it throughout the day. And you can just make this alive. And you, you can, I tell you, you get built up like that and you're ready to go, right? If you, how, how many of you, well, maybe I shouldn't ask this. <laughs> Is there anybody that just, well, I don't want this to be a trick either. <laughs> so, okay, let me put it this way. If you were feeling just pressed down, if the enemy has just pressed you down, he's just put all his burden right, I will tell you the fastest way there's two ways to get free of that very quick. One way is just to get a believer to come to you and break that thing off of you. Amen? Any believer can do it. Secondly, now this may be a little, may take a little more bravery on your part, but it's a good way, and that is for you to, you just get up and preach this stuff. You start preaching, I'm telling you, every day whenever I'm finished at the end, by, by noon every day, I'm pumped. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't preach this without just coming alive. Amen? You ought to, Get one of those new man seminars back there on CD or something and just put it on and listen to it. And whatever I say, just repeat it, yeah. right? Just like you're preaching it and you watch. Watch, it'll come alive in you. I'm telling you, why? Because it's just scripture. It's just the word of God and it comes alive. Amen? Amen. Amen. You want to get this? Preach it. That's the way to get it. Best way to, listen, best way to get something is to give it out. You can't give it out without you getting more back. That works for preaching too, right? You want, you want to get this in you? Put it out. You put it out, it comes back more. Amen?